And so they prefer this hybrid polymer battery because you can still maintain the properties of the liquid. Talking batteries with our favorite battery specialist called Ash. Now, my question is regarding solid state batteries. Basically, what is the big deal about them? So uh, solid state batteries essentially uh, have a solid state electrolyte. In normal lithium ion batteries, the electrolyte is a carefully guarded secret or a liquid recipe. And unfortunately, this liquid usually is flammable. The liquid is prone to temperature changes and to freezing and also to evaporation and gasifying when you heat it too much. And so that, present, that presents some risks and we've been seeing battery fires. Um, and we also see that current lithium ion batteries uh, have very poor performance in cold weather due to freezing. So a solid state electrolyte essentially allows the battery to operate in a much wider temperature range because it doesn't really need to freeze at, at uh, below zero degrees of freezing temperature. And it doesn't really, really evaporate or gasify at higher temperatures. And so it is inherently safer. The fact that it is safer also allows you to use more energy dense uh, cathodes and anodes and so uh, you can use solid lithium which is very energy dense in a sense and so that allows you to increase the energy density of the battery tremendously so the theoretical energy density is much larger than a traditional lithium ion battery the problem right now with solid state batteries is the cycle life and degradation so they can solve performance they can solve energy density but what we're seeing currently is cycle life is limited it's, we're seeing usually about 500 cycles, 800 cycles. And this is because in a, in a normal battery with the liquid electrolyte, so the degradation can be essentially diluted and spread around. And so it's mitigated. In a solid state battery, the degradation, when it happens, it's, it's stuck exactly where it, where it occurred. And so it becomes almost permanent and you cannot really reverse the degradation or dilute the degradation. And so we're watching it very carefully and we hope that they can solve uh, the cycle life issue because um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you have a battery that's tremendously energy dense, if you have you know, less than a thousand or two thousand cycles, it won't be competitive on the market. Well, for those extreme use cases, it might be competitive, right? If you have those batteries that are needed extreme temperatures, maybe there's no other option available. Well, there are ways to work around it. Uh, operating in extreme temperatures, you can always use alternative chemistries like uh, lithium titanate oxide, LTO, or with niobium, so NTO, uh, which Toshiba and Ekion are working on or you essentially beef up the thermal management system to essentially keep the battery at a certain operating temperature. And so these methods are more understood, more mature, uh, and less risky than essentially changing the entire battery chemistry right now. All right, excellent. And what, is, uh, what do you think is the current time frame by when we might see the first real deployment of solar cell batteries in the commercial world? Uh, some of them are already in operation, actually. So there is a company called uh, Gogoro uh, operating in, the, uh, in Asia. Uh, in Taiwan specifically, and they're spreading around in Korea, Japan, and India. And so they do electric scooters with batteries that you can swap in and out with uh, public charging swapping stations. And so they are using a, a form of solid state batteries that is more understood. And you can also have, you know, you don't have to go all the way to a solid electrolyte. You can go in between a solid and liquid. So polymers are often considered. So uh, lithium ion polymer batteries are uh, being used typically by Hyundai and companies like Electrovia, for example. And so they prefer this hybrid polymer battery because you can still maintain the properties of the liquid, um, but it also you get some properties of the solid state as well. And by carefully or architecturing or engineering the separator, you can allow the energy density of the cathode and anode to increase while maintaining safety. And so there are competitors that are, I would say that would compete with solid state uh, with polymer batteries. You mentioned in earlier session that uh, we have seen quite a lot of progress in the two-wheeler space uh, because it's uh, a different equation weight versus uh, range uh, as a lot of these two-wheelers only travel 10 five kilometers or so in a city travel and we're seeing a lot of two-wheelers now being announced uh, also in in north america uh, with now different battery technologies yeah the, so the two the two-wheeler space is very interesting because their business model is that uh, you don't really own the battery and so the company operating it has full control over you know what batteries are most degraded how do we take them off circulation into the entire um, the entire ecosystem and how do we refurbish them or put a new cell into the packs and so the customer themselves are not exposed to the risk 
of a de of a faster degrading battery. And so, uh, if you remove that risk, you remove that liability. Then essentially, it's de-risked, and the cus the customer doesn't have to worry about having to buy an entire battery pack. At the same time, the company can do real life testing, collect enormous amounts of data that helps them improve chemistry uh, incrementally with new generations and put it back into circulation. And I can imagine, I mean, if you then design a battery that, that ideally is only charged to 70%, but has many other attributes in terms of uh, the number of cycles or fire safety, that if you own the battery and if it's only been charged in your own infrastructure, you can make absolutely sure uh, that the charging cycle will always be 70%. That's all software limited. So there's a lot of trickery and a lot of uh, buffering being done by battery companies to limit the charging rate. So they essentially limit the maximum voltage. And we're seeing many trends like that, uh, even in the stationary world, where they will not actually let the battery charge to its maximum capacity to conserve uh, degradation, to conserve the actual battery capacity. This was also seen quite uh, quite often in, in GM batteries in the early generations of the Chevy Volt, right? Where the, the, the battery was buffered internally. So you had extra capacity that the car would then tap into as the battery is degrading. But you, as the consumer, you would not notice this. You would just see consistent range throughout your ownership.